So we're going to try to move smartly into our, our, next, uh, our next panel, which uh, will be uh, seeing the nature of California, artist, map maker, and scientist. And our moderator will be UCLA professor of history and uh, one of the directors at the Autry, uh, uh, Stephen Aaron. OK. All right, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Stephen Aaron. As Glenn mentioned a moment ago, it's my pleasure to be here and to welcome you to the second panel on Seeing the Nature of California, the Artist, the Map Maker, the Scientist, to which I guess might be added the museum professional to that list, um, because I think that this panel and the issue of boom uh, from which it derives I think nicely highlight the ways is, in which it is in museums as well as at universities and um, in environmental groups that the most interesting thinking about nature and thinking with nature is taking place. Um, that thinking, um, as this panel will, I hope, uh, elucidate for you, I think has prompted a fresh approach to how we see the nature of California past present and future. The investigations uh, that are put forward in, in this issue of BOOM, in particular by the panelists here, uh, the investigations of the natural world uh, open up for us and reflect for us, I should say, move us beyond Muir, maybe going back to the conference title, move us beyond Muir uh, by opening up the relationship between uh, urban and rural settings and between human and non-human worlds in a variety of places. Um, I suppose this panel, I hope, will give further insight uh, into why the Institute of the Environment, uh, and you can correct me on the history of this as a historian here, I should know this, but it was several years, that when the Institute of the Environment was founded, it was founded as IOES, uh, IOE, Institute of the Environment, to which in some recent moment was added S, right, for sustainability. Yeah. And I think the panel and the, the panel presentations in this one, this one in particular will help us to think about the ways in which our reflections on nature, past, present, and future allow us to think anew about questions about sustainability. So I'm going to start by quickly introducing the four panelists uh, on this group, and they are um, Turned it off. Well, the phone <laughs> is being rung by. <laughs> so we'll start there with, with uh, H. Bradley Schaffer, who is a distinguished professor of ecology and evolutionary biology at the University of California, Los Angeles, and director of the Lacretz, I should know because we're near that building, the Lacretz Center for California Conservation Scientists, which is part of the UCLA's IOES. Um, going back then to the first on the left, uh, or my uh, first, first on the right, <laughs> never mind, Amy Scott, <laughs> who is the chief curator uh, and Marilyn and Calvin B. Gross curator of visual arts at the Autry National Center of the American West. Next to her is, um, no, actually we'll go to the far side, is Lila Higgins, who is not here with her co-author, but is a museum educator uh, with a background in environmental education and entomology. She's currently the uh, manager of citizen science at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. And finally, we have now Ruth Askevold, who uh, is the, uh, who uh, helped, is, is the, um, manages the, res the Resilient Landscape Program at the San Francisco Estuary Institute. Uh, and her, all of their articles are featured in this issue of Boom which I hope you will all read avidly after this panel. So we'll start with Amy Scott. Thanks, Steve. And um, thanks also to Glenn and to John for inviting me to contribute um, to this issue of Boom and to speak in this, um, or to contribute to this conversation today. It's given me a lot of opportunity to rethink um, some of the connections between romantic era landscape and urban landscapes of today, how one continues to inform the other in, albeit unexpected, um, ways. So one of my interests as an art historian really is the space, in between the landscape image and the experience of place, the cultural filters that an artist brings to their work and how those surface within a given image. 
Within the American West, the topic of landscape is best approached as a layered one. Here, landscapes have been layered upon landscapes in ways not unlike geological strata, each covering the one underneath it, but nonetheless shaped by its presence. These layers are especially rich in places like Yosemite, where cultural and visual landscapes are deeply intertwined, albeit in ways their creators did not always intend. Yosemite's original artists were the Miwok and Mono Lake Paiute residents, those who Muir did not see, who created from the physical environment a sustainable system of food preparation and storage in which early design informed by functional aesthetics blossomed into elaborate patterns. It was about the same time that these baskets were made that the New York painter Albert Bierstadt discovered, again in air quotes, the romantic potential of its cliffs and valleys, creating monumental paintings that impressed upon national audiences ideals of divinity, monumentality, and timelessness. Although Bierstadt's Yosemite was native made through periodic burning, his work advocated patterns <coughs> of seeing reliant upon native removal or marginalization at best. Relegated to decorative status within a landscape they had once managed, some Native artists found new opportunities in the market, created or generated by their lingering, if changed, presence. As collectors and tourists flocked to purchase baskets by Lucy Tellez, Carrie Bethel, and others, weavers responded by pushing the medium into new aesthetic territory, creating monumental works that equal grand landscape paintings in both creative ambition and technical execution. Thus it is that two seemingly oppositional art forms of landscape are evident in one another. Indian people cannot be seen in grand landscape painting, but they are there in the shapely meadows and healthy game populations that artists like Bierstadt so admired. Likewise, Bierstadt is an unseen presence in aspects of Lucy Tellez's famous work, such as her big basket, which you see behind her, one of the largest Yosemite baskets ever made as she capitalized on the market for an authentically American experience, notice also her plains um, fringed buckskin dress, <laughs> as well as the desire for works that expressed environmental grandeur and largesse that Bierstadt's paintings had helped to nurture. As Muir would have likely denied, but that this sequence suggests, historical, social, and economic relationships are embedded in landscape art. Now that Yosemite is 150 years old, artists armed with critical perspectives and methodological awarenesses are helping us to see how the shifting politics of history continue to surface in the contemporary landscape. And this is pure coincidence, I swear. Brian and I, or Byron and I did not <laughs> collude on this at all. Um, I'm an admirer of his work and that of Mark Collette, and this happens to be one of my favorite. Um, Yosemite panoramas of theirs precisely because it shows so many instances of um, photographic art history showing up within the landscape. Mark Clett and Byron Wolf, for example, situate the contemporary landscape in its historic image by layering one upon the other, demonstrating the geographical and conceptual proximity between present and past. Often utilizing the time-bound format of the panorama, their work unfolds as an experience of place, one that accounts for history rather than brushes over it. This accounting for history, as well as the interest in the specificities of time, as opposed to the sense of timelessness advocated by Romantic era artists, that we see in the Wolk of Klet and Wolf represents a more recent turn in California landscape art, one that is both more self-aware and, at times, environmentally sensitive. While Yosemite's rich art history has attracted a great deal of scholarly attention, Less explored is the territory between classical landscapes such as this and our everyday lived experience. Los Angeles, an urban wilderness, if you will, that some feel is approaching nightmarish proportions, <laughs> represents newer artistic territory and makes a particularly useful contrast to the famously pristine versions of Yosemite discussed previous. James Doolan's Bridges, for example, adopts the conventions of 19th century romantic landscape, including scale and composition, to aggrandize the urban environment while simultaneously dispossessing it of human presence. In this painting, the elegant arches and towering walls of LA freeway, LA's freeway infrastructure take the place of cliffs and falls. Driverless, assembly line cars circulating within it cleaves people from the environment. Divine mist is replaced by polluted haze. 
At the same time, Doolin uses scale and numerous compositional devices to make the scene appear truly majestic, the urban equal to the more classically beautiful valley. This aestheticization of what some may call the commonplace against the backdrop of a rapidly changing environment points further to the increased interest in landscapes of commerce and heavy industry, especially in this pan-Pacific turned global city. Aerial photographer Michael Light seeks to reveal the impact of commerce and development in terms of the enduring geological realities these forces create. Light, too, is aware of the historic presentation of landscape photographs and, like Watkins before him, binds multiple images of individual landscapes, as in this San Pedro series, into hand-produced books that function not unlike earlier mammoth plate folios of the 19th century. Seen in serial form and from an aerial vantage, Light's work functions also not unlike survey photography, in which war large swaths of land were indexed, diagrammed, and mapped into our consciousness. As Light's work shows, the dialogue between art and land in California today is less concerned with timelessness than with timeliness. By this, I mean the ephemeral tends to be privileged over the eternal, the momentary over the enduring. Ed Ruscha's Every Building on the Sunset Strip reads like a typical panorama, an unfolding journey down the famous Los Angeles Boulevard. <coughs> Pieced together without concern for visual scenes, it functions as a bumpy, disjointed tour of stucco apartment buildings, liquor stores, <coughs> hotels, and coffee shops. Like many photographic series, it too is bound into a book, but this is no exquisite handcrafted volume. Mass produced by the artist and originally sold for $3, I wish I had bought one of those, <laughs> it is a self-contained archive of bland architecture and urban sprawl, a consumerism stripped of its uplifting effects. Even, as an, artist, as, uh, even an artist as unconcerned with the glories of nature as Ed Ruscha still owes a debt to history. His panoramic, survey-like approach, the archival format of the book, even the way he wields the camera like an objective, dispassionate tool, all make him a distant cousin of Carlton Watkins, whose view from the Sentinel Dome was one of the first attempts to employ the panoramic format in landscape photography. We know now that Watkins' so-called objectivity was actually a highly constructive vision that wrote out native presence while inviting settlers to inhabit its vast, empty spaces. 100 years later, unending population growth has created the Sunset Strip, an entirely different, yet no less iconic, California landscape. What I hope to have convinced you of is that such places are often conceptually, if not geographically, closer than they appear. Thank you. We have to fend for ourselves. No, no, no. Yeah, I can't. She knows. I'm kid. I. Well, maybe I should. No, she knows how to do it. She's got it. So uh, you could do any of them. Oh, not that. Not that. Not the kid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> any, any. This one up here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we weren't sure, so we just put them all in here. Yeah, exactly. All right. Okay. Great. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Um, as I was procrastinating a couple days ago, putting this talk together, wh what I did instead was lay out a report we had just finished, and, and I realized it was a report on a hill near Martinez uh, behind John Muir's house, and it was to recreate the historical landscape when John Muir was there um, of this hill named Mount Wanda, and he named it after his daughter. And, and I, I'm largely influenced by um, John Christensen, and I thought, wow, I don't, I don't really know John Muir at all anymore. I don't know what he is. So th this is a great day to, to be here and hear all the dis this discourse and back and forth and um, a lot of opinions about him. Um, so that's what we do at, at um, the San Francisco Estuary Institute, which is a big mouthful. And I know it's way up north where there's that bay referred to as the San Francisco Bay. But we, we work down here too. But I, I'm going to give examples from both places. Um, we really believe that key to a resilient future is understanding the historical landscape and how it functioned in the past. And while the past may strike many as kind of not very relevant, impending climate change, we find the past to be an excellent starting place. 
We do this not simply, as John said, so we can replicate the past like some stamp, but really to gain a full understanding of the physical processes that are underlying, such as geology, soils, topography, and the eco ecological functions and services that we uh, may want but have lost. So I'll give you a quick example of this. Sea level rise is a very real thing. If you're anywhere along the edge of the San Francisco Bay, it's lapping at our feet. Historically, tidal marshes surrounded, surrounding the bay's edge acted as a natural buffer, protecting the uplands um, during large storm events. But we've lost over 80% of the tidal marshes along the bay. They were diked and drained for grazing and farms and salt ponds or filled and paid, paved over for highways, railroads, and sewage treatment plants. Us humans have a whole lot of infrastructure right on the edge of the bay that we're interested in protecting. <coughs> there are a number of options to deal with this. Do nothing. Build a tall levee. Build a long sloping levee. Retreat. Hope for the best. One option of getting, getting a lot of interest is to use the buffering qualities of wetlands and tidal marshes to protect the upland edge. But all options are expensive and complex and no one solution fits the whole bay. But understanding how tidal marshes worked historically around the bay and how they might work in the future is one part of the solution. So we start by studying the historical landscape and developing a map of what the landscape types were before there were major disturbances. Here's how this process works. Pick a study area, usually related to a watershed. Find some funding. Set aside a couple years of your life. <laughs> <laughs> Gather thousands of pieces of data, historical maps, photographs, landscape paintings, newspaper accounts, records of species, explorers' journals, court testimonies, and compile and interpret them all. Develop a team that pours over the data and maps, sorting through the myriad sources. Put most of what you found into a geographic information system. Read surveyors' notes until their language becomes your own, and you can feel the surveyors' chain move through your hands. Establish the edge of the shore, the shape of the tidal marsh, the evidence of willow groves. Correlate wet meadows with certain soil types. Learn from court testimony how a creek was diverted. Read a newspaper account of how a marsh was filled for grazing. After two years, emerge with a snapshot of a landscape that has become more real to you than the paved street you live on. And what does this snapshot represent? <clears throat> it's a snapshot in time of how the landscape functioned a couple hundred years ago when the land was managed by the Native Americans. And I'm going to quote um, Mary Ellen Hannibal here, uh, who wrote in the article about the use of fire by Native Americans. The pre-American landscape, quote, was not an untouched Eden, but a practically human-made landscape, a series of habitat patches that were deliberately ecologically managed. But it was managed in a different way before the massive modifications that started with the arrival of the Spanish and Mexicans and only accelerated with the Americans. In short order, the Americans got busy ditching, diverting, flattening, cutting through, building up, smoothing over, paving, damming, and draining. We bought, sold, cut down, hunted, farmed, quarried, and mined. We made the landscape the one we have today, one of underground creeks, filled tidal marshes, and grizzly bears only on the state flag. One of the products for each study area is a map, accompanied by a long, long report. A map of historical landscapes represented through land types like wet meadows, oak savannas, freshwater marsh, alkali wetlands, tidal marsh channels. John approached us with the idea of publishing some of the maps in Boom, without a legend or much to guide the reader at all, and to just let the maps and the patterns on the maps speak for themselves. I actually thought, you know, my, I noticed my title in this is project manager, which sounds really boring. Like it's, it, you know, the title of the session is an artist, a <coughs> scientist, and a project manager. It's a, <laughs> <laughs> it's a map maker, and that's actually I wear a lot of hats there. But that's that's what I, that's a lot of what I do is um, 
make maps, so just to clarify. So I, th I thought the, the really hard, hardcore, it sounds like I'm criticizing them, the hardcore scientists I work with, I thought they, they would um, not want to just show these maps without any kind of legend. We always have legends and north errors and scales and explanatory text, and, and, I, and I thought maybe they wouldn't want to, but they really got into it. But we suggested to John that we add the contemporary imagery next to it, and he agreed. So there's this kind of call and response between the images as you go back and forth between the two sets. I hope the unfamiliar shapes and patterns of the historical maps that help us see the, help us see the urban landscape of California represents layers of human history intertwined with natural processes. While the urban infrastructure appears solid and immutable, immutable it really is just a veneer covering a relatively recent landscape of tidal marshes, creeks, freshwater ponds, seasonal wetlands, grasslands, scrub oaks, and vast dune fields. I like to think someone viewing the historical map and the contemporary imagery gets a glimpse into these forgotten habitats and starts to understand why we might want to incorporate them into our future. I hope we start to see we've always managed the landscape for thousands of years, and even by doing nothing, we're still making choices. Thanks very much. This is forward and back, yes? Yeah, or this is, is okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, thank you for, uh, thank you to John and to Glenn for inviting me both, both to this issue of Boom Magazine and also to, to uh, present for a few minutes here. Um, my, my title, is boom um, in uh, in recognition of the journal, and also a couple of things that I'll talk about, which is genomics. That's kind of pretty serious, hardcore techie science, and that's a lot of the kind of science I do in my lab. Um, Wild California. That's really the theme of, of much of this ta of this session. Um, and tortoises. Tortoises happen to be one of the great joys in my life, and I'll I'll tell you a little bit about that. So to give you a little bit of context. Um, about the work that we do in our center and the work that I do in my lab. Um, I first wanted to show you this, this image. This is a, uh, a picture of the Old Woman Mountains in the Eastern Mojave uh, Desert. The Old Woman's are a, uh, a wilderness area. Um, we were out there with a class. This is our class camping out for eight days, a UCLA class of undergraduates. And the Old Woman's are a region where there's no internet, there's no cell phone coverage, and there's no roads, okay? Mm -hmm. You wanna take a class out here, you wanna do anything, you walk. You wanna drink some water, you bring it in. Um, it's an amazing place, and I live for these kinds of places. They're, they're just unbelievably gorgeous. The other thing that I kind of live for are these animals. These are just a, a few of the reptiles and amphibians that we work on in our group. Um, lizards, frogs, turtles, some from California, some from around the world. Um, this group of animals has just been sort of an obsession of mine since I was a very young boy. Uh, it probably will be till I go to the grave. Um, I think they're the best animals on earth. So what I want to do is talk to you about landscapes, wild landscapes, reptiles and amphibians, in particular desert tortoises, and sort of what's going on in California and how we can use some of our sort of high-tech solutions um, to come to, if not solutions, at least good compromises on how we, how we manage natural lands and landscapes. So this is a uh, picture that I clipped um, without checking about copyright from the LA Times. Um, it was published in the LA Times about a month ago, I guess. And this is Sally Jewell, um, our Secretary of Interior, most arguably the most powerful person who protects wildlands uh, in the United States. Um, and it's an article about a plan for the Mojave Desert that seeks to 
um, develop uh, to a very full extent alternative energy sources in the Mojave, windmills, uh, solar panel farms, and protect endangered species, and to do both, to look for sort of those win-win compromises, so, or win-win solutions. So on the one hand, there's this. On the other hand, there's this. This is a desert, a California desert tortoise, a species that only lives in California and a little bit in Nevada, uh, federally protected under, under federal law, under the U.S. Endangered Species Act, a species that's declining across its entire range and that happens to like to live in a lot of places where we put alternative energy. To, to give you a little bit more of a context about this, um, this is, unfortunately, you can't quite see this as well as I would like, but this is a picture that I took from along the edge of uh, Interstate 15, the freeway that goes up to, up to uh, Las Vegas. And I took this last spring. And this is sort of a view of at least one aspect of the Mojave Desert. I think it's a view that John Muir would have liked an awful lot. Um, it's striking, gorgeous mountains with beautiful flats flatlands in the foreground, that's where the tortoises like to live. Um, pretty much pristine, pretty much in great shape. Turn a few degrees from this exact spot. You don't have to walk anywhere. And this is what we see now in parts of the Mojave. Not huge parts, but, but definitely important parts. And those flat lands are getting converted and covered um, with here, it's a large solar panel farm. Okay, this takes out square kilometers of land, hundreds, thousands of acres of land, and converts it for alternative energy use. Now, we all like green energy. We all, and I'm, I certainly believe in this, we believe that, that getting off of fossil fuels and get on, getting onto alternative energy is a great thing to do. Unfortunately, what this means is that from a tortoise point of view and from a lot of other organisms' points of view, um, they can't cross this anymore. That you might as well pave it. You might as well put a Costco there. <coughs> and in addition, it generates a tremendous amount of heat, and that may take out lots of other organisms, perhaps more than a Costco would. Okay. So, so the question is, what do we do about this? How do we kind of make this work? And the so so the question before us, I think this is an important one, at least looking forward in preserving our wildlands, is. For example, can we position solar panel farms in a way that minimizes impacts on tortoises? Are there good places and bad places to put those things? And what's up for grabs in many ways are these very, very critical pieces of land in areas like the Mojave Desert that are corridors between existing national parks. No one's gonna pave, at least for the moment, the national parks, but there are these very large millions of acres of land corridors between those parks that are open for development and that wildlife and plants need if they're going to maintain populations. And the question is, what happens to those corridors that aren't in national parks but that are on public land? And I would argue that genomics, that is studying the genes that are in those tortoises or in you and I or whatever, in any living organism, can help us do that. And, and let me tell you a little bit about how. So genes on landscapes, okay? We've always used genetics to learn about how organisms move around. You know, the fact is, is that you on average are more closely related to somebody from your hometown than you are to somebody from around the world. Why? Because your genes travel with you and your kids and there's a, there's a pattern of movement of genes across landscapes, and we can use that to learn where organisms, be they people or tortoises, tend to move. And what we want to know is where do tortoises go and where don't they go, okay? Um, in the past, we could access, access a very, very tiny part of the genome. And in the last couple of years, because of work done on human genomes, we can now look at the whole damn thing. A tortoise genome has roughly 2.2 billion pieces of information in it, and we can look at ex with exquisite, exquisite detail at the genetic differences and similarities of tortoises or anything else we want to on landscapes and use that really to ask the tortoise the question, where do you like to move and where don't you like to move? Where do you like to, what are the habitats that are important to you and what are the ones that aren't? 
And if we can really understand that for tortoises and other organisms, well then hopefully we can plop our alternative energy places down in the places that the tortoises don't go anyhow. And that would be something close to a win-win. So let's see how that works. Okay, so here's a, oh dear, well, colors didn't come out so hot, but that's okay. Um, this is a map of the, um, of the Mojave Desert. It's sort of Eastern California and, and Southern Nevada. And each one of those numbers is a tortoise. Okay, so our, my colleagues and I go out and we catch tortoises, we take a couple of drops of blood from a tortoise, we let the tortoise go, and then we can look at its entire genome from those two drops of blood. And this is an elevational map where the kind of green and yellow is higher elevation, the pale colors are lower elevation, okay? And so we went out, got a few hundred tortoises from across the Mojave Desert and associated areas, and then we sequenced them for their whole genomes, okay? And we sort of asked the question, well, where do they seem to move and not move based on this kind of landscape? And what each dot is here is a tortoise, okay? And it's color-coded across those the entire 2.2 billion base pairs of DNA um, in terms of how similar they are to other tortoises. So this is kind of a slice through the genetic variation in that data set. And just to give you one example, so if we, if we zero in on that area right there, that's an area called the Ivanpah Valley that runs from Mojave National Preserve up into southern Nevada, and sort of look in closely at that, what you can see is that there's this big cluster of red dots. Those are all tortoises that are really, really closely related. And it implies that the tortoises and their babies all march around a lot in that area, unimpeded. You move just a little bit to the east or a little bit to the south, and there's a huge change in the colors. And what that means is that tortoises don't go across that boundary, okay? And they haven't for a very long time, for thousands and thousands of generations. Why not? Because there's that little yellow halo surrounding those red dots. That yellow halo is a ridge that's maybe a thousand feet tall. These are not, this is not Mount Everest. These are, but, but these are hills and mountains that the tortoises don't, don't traverse. I would argue if what you want to do is place windmills somewhere, put them on those yellow ridges, which are probably good anyhow, and you know, the tortoises don't go there and they never have and you won't be impeding anything, you won't be messing anything up, or at least you'll be minimally doing so. Can take another look here. Um, this is another slice through that genetic variation, and you can see there's a big blue cluster of points in the east and a reddish cluster of points in the west, okay? And kind of a light area separates those two. I wish I had a pointer to, to show you, but you can see that. Well, that light area is not mountains. Okay, and one of the problems with mountains is that it's pretty hard to develop a lot of stuff on mountains. What that white area is, is a very, very low elevation valley. It's called the Cadiz Valley. And it's so low and so hot that tortoises don't like it. Okay, you want a big flat area for solar panel farms? Put it there. Might be a great spot, right? As opposed to a spot that people have been, you know, putting a lot of stuff, which is up in the Ivanpah Valley, which is full of tortoises that are marching all over the place. And we can use this kind of information, I think, for tortoises and for other organisms to ask, um, to ask you know, where to place these either improvements or insults to, to a natural environment in very effective ways. This is just a, a, a visual of, to, to remind me to mention that we can get very, very detailed on this as well because we also have fabulous new GIS, Geographic Information Systems, uh, data layers for all of California. So this is a, just a sort of visual representation of 88 different ways of looking at the state of California. It's the rockiness of a slope. It's the angle of a slope. It's the precise kinds of vegetation that live on that slope. And we now have that information for the entire state at 30 meter resolution. That, that's the size of a building lot in LA, okay? So at that level of resolution for the entire damn state, which is, which is amazing. And so we can ask where, you know, we can, we can characterize landscapes, look at that genetic differentiation at this very fine level and say, well, tortoise, do tortoises maybe don't like rocky slopes? 
Do they not like places that have certain kinds of plants on them? And sort of micromanage how we develop the landscapes at a, much, at a greater level. Um, I think we can do that. We can use it to help save tortoises. Um, and we can do that as we, as we manage the landscapes of California, including the Mojave Desert, in a, in a sort of meaningful and responsible way. Is that gonna give us a Mojave Desert that I personally happen to like? The on honest answer is not so much. You know, I kinda like the Mojave Desert the way it used to be, but we're not gonna get that. We need those alternative energy sources. We need those compromises solutions. And I think at least as scientists, um, we can do that. That's what our Lacrette Center does, and I think that's what we should do. Thank you very much. thank John and Glenn uh, for having me here today. I didn't get invited to write for Boom. I actually invited myself. I invite myself to parties all the time. <laughs> and so why would it be any different for writing? Um, so when I was 14, I moved from uh, merry old England to the suburbs of Los Angeles. My parents were divorced, and my dad was finally agreeing that I was allowed to move to the heart of America, uh, earthquake central California. I moved from the idyllic countryside of Britain where I got to play in fields, climb hollow trees, ride in donkey carts. Um, it was truly a, like the magical British empire. Fast forward to halfway through freshman year of high school and I'm living in the inland empire and I'm <laughs> able to um, you know, walk through strip malls, uh, drive through miles and miles of asphalt on roads and there's a swimming pool in almost every backyard. Needless to say, I not only had culture shock, I also had nature shock. I had been accustomed to views like this, and this, and this. And now I was seeing views like this, and this, and this. I had to learn to see nature in a, in a whole new way. So I went to college, and I studied bugs. Um, before that, I would have looked at a landscape like this and seen all the green, uh, grays and the, the browns and thought, this is a dead landscape. But after I went to college, I soon learned to be able to see the tiny insects that live there. On just one solitary plant, a coyote bush, I could find tarantula hawk wasps, cucumber beetles, lovely uh, skipper butterflies, ladybugs, flower flies, and assassin bugs, just to name a few. And there's thousands of plants here in California. We've got 6,500 native species um, of plants, so just extrapolate. Um, and so you see, LA, we're in a biodiversity hotspot, but what does that actually mean? So Conservation <laughs> International has this designation, there's 35 of them in the world. Um, it's a place that has incredible biodiversity, at least 1,500 endemic plant <laughs> species in the area, but it's, they're also places that have extreme uh, threats from human influences, up to 70% or more have been lost uh, due to our human influences. And so you can see that the California Floristic Province is on par with places like the, Madag the islands of Madagascar and the tropical Andes. But when I show people pictures of Los Angeles like this, that gets totally lost. You see the loss, that we've lost all of that, but you don't see the nature. People see the roads, they see the concretized river, they see all the buildings, but they, they miss the background, the, the mountains there, and all the nature that's still in that asphalt. So you have to look for nature. When I moved to Los Angeles in 2008, that's exactly what I did. I started looking places like Griffith Park, which is the largest uh, municipal park with an urban wilderness in the United States. I started looking in the LA River, 51 miles, that cuts through the heart of the city and through 15 other cities. And I also started looking at the museum in our new nature garden an urban field site that we built to study urban biodiversity and a place for every Angelino to come and engage in that uh, study. Because this truly is a new frontier for science. And we have scientists at the museum who are doing that. This is Dr. Brian Brown. He's our curator of entomology. 
and he is one of the world's leading fly experts. He studies humpback flies. And he's also a very boastful scientist. So one day he was uh, talking to a trustee and he's like, oh, I can find new species of fly anywhere. I don't need to go down to Brazil or Costa Rica. I can find one in your backyard. Your, your backyard's in Brentwood, right next to your swimming pool, I'll do it. So he took a trap just like this, set it up in the backyard, and left it up for a week. He brought the sample jar back to the museum, sorted out all the insects, only looked at the flies. He was like, I don't care about anything else. And pulled out one fly, that big one right there, and looked at it under the microscope, took it through the key, and it didn't match anything. It was a brand new species, never before to been discovered by science. <laughs> he pulled out a second fly. He's like, this one looks interesting. It's got an interesting like hind tarsal segment. Maybe it was the tibia. I don't really remember. Anyway, it's the other one with the head popped off. And he took that through the key, and that one had never before been found in North America. It had only been found in Europe up until this point. And he also found a third fly, that one on the bottom corner. That was also never before found in America. It had only been found on both the east and west coasts of Africa. So to recap, in only one week of studying, looking at these, uh, looking for insects in this backyard in Brentwood, and only looking at the forage flies, he, he discovered three scientifically important discoveries. And it's not just about flies. How can we translate this to all over Los Angeles? And how can we translate this to uh, not just insects, but to all other organisms as well? Our herpetologist, Dr. Greg Pauly, says citizen science is the only feasible answer. And citizen science is, you know, we've talked about it a little bit already today, getting non-scientists involved in the scientific process, getting them to go out to their backyards, schoolyards, local parks, and getting them to notice and, and see the nature all around them and help us to make those discoveries alongside us. Because Greg can't go into backyards in the middle of night uh, looking for the geckos that he wants to look for. Not only would it be incredibly stupid, he's also a museum scientist, so he's incredibly overworked and, and, and very underpaid. <laughs> so instead, we do things like create projects like the reptiles and amphibians of Southern California. Greg likes to call it rascals. We're all really into acronyms at the museum. And uh, Rascals uh, is a citizen science project that leverages the smartphone and the crowd. And in Southern California, that's 22 million people. <laughs> so you take pictures of reptiles and amphibians. You send them into our project on iNaturalist, which is basically like Facebook for nature nerds. And then Greg, at the uh, click of a button, can see what species have been seen, where they've been seen, and who's been finding them, and then can like, have a conversation with them back and forth, just like Facebook. Um, and so, for instance, we had this one guy, Reese. He was nine years old, and he found a little gecko, like that one right there. It was in someone's backyard in the middle of the night. So you can totally send kids to do what scientists can't do. <laughs> and he found this gecko, and he was like, this is something I've never seen before. He went through his little field book. He didn't see a gecko that looked like that. So he sent a picture into the museum. And indeed, it was a new species, sorry, uh, not a brand new species, but a new discovery for Los Angeles. It was an introduced species from uh, the Mediterranean region and had never before been found in Los Angeles. So he was the first person to find it here. And working with his dad and also with Greg Pauly, he wrote the observation up. And at the age of 13, he's published in the scientific journal. <laughs> Yay, Reese! Um, and then we have other projects like Bioscan. Again, I told you we really liked our acronyms. Um, and this is really looking at the insect biodiversity in Los Angeles. Um, it's using the same techniques that Brian used in that Brentwood backyard, those, those tents. And it's in 30 different places all over the city. And it's over three years. And we couldn't do this project without citizen scientists. Those traps, 28 of them are in people's backyards. And like Sydney here in Atwater Village. And because of these, because of these citizen scientists, we've been able to make awesome discoveries like twisted wing parasites in Silver Lake, coffin flies in a backyard where a family member had just recently buried their dead dog, and ant decapitating flies in Glendale. They just told us that they found 30 new species of forage flies in Los Angeles. Each one's going to be named for a different citizen scientist who's working with us on the project. And so that's pretty amazing. But it's not, it's not just about cool insect discoveries. It's not just about the 30 new species. It's really about making a big data set, a more complete data set for our city. Um, we're making conservation decisions and urban planning decisions on a regular basis. And without a complete data set, those decisions are going to be somewhat flawed. And so if we can crowdsource that data set and get people involved in it, we can actually build a better city for Los Angeles in the future. 
And if we, Los Angeles, can do that, then we can be a model for other cities, and we can start to build cities that are better for wildlife and for humans. Thank you. Okay. So um, thank you very much to our panelists. Um, I, I guess I will eschew long uh, sort of uh, comment here and sort of just very quickly though, so uh, before opening up to questions from the audience uh, and then trying to get us back on track for the, uh, to have some break here, uh, sort of maybe return to the wither John Muir question that has framed uh, some of today's proceedings and certainly, um, I, as I said in, in my opening remarks, it seemed to me the panelists would, uh, their presentations would, like their articles in Boom, would demolish the idea that somehow there is a sharp dichotomy between pristine wilderness past, where nature can be experienced in this uh, uncontaminated form, uh, and then the often hopelessly corrupted, urban, denatured present. Um, and certainly, as I said, I think the panelists make clear why that framework, uh, and to the extent that that framework, the, uh, the, the pristine wilderness past is associated with John Muir, I suppose it tarnishes the legacy of John Muir, but it does occur to me it was John Christensen who edited the issue of Boom uh, <laughs> and put it together, so perhaps it's no surprise that uh, the issue tilts towards identifying the, the trouble with wilderness as, as that kind of paradigm. But I would invite any of the panelists here before opening up to questions, if they'd like to add any comments about how Muir's work uh, and this broader framework maybe, or broader paradigm, uh, shapes their understandings of how they do and what they do. Uh, in seeing nature uh, in all sorts of unexpected places. Well, I think uh, Muir, you know, can't be left behind when it comes to art anyway. I mean, he was so influential in <coughs> artists like Bierstadt and, of course, Ansel Adams, perhaps even more, um, that a lot of 20th century artists and 21st century artists, when dealing with a place like Yosemite, have to figure out how to sort of get around that vision somehow. So um, there's really no way of ignoring it. And do they put it, do they frame it ironically, as sort of new topographic photographers did by juxtaposing Half Dome with trash cans and um, photographing parking lots and sort of um, the pave it and paint it green photograph, which is a sea of cars in front of um, a beautiful, um, I think it's Half Dome. So there's the ironic take on it. There is, um, um, other takes as well, uh, there's the Richard Miserac take on it, which sort of aestheticizes environmental damage and, and destruction, both human-caused and, and naturally occurring. So there are a variety of ways in which artists, at least, have responded to it, but they all do have to respond in, in some way, shape, or form, um, especially in a place like Yosemite. And <coughs> to that extent, um, he's very much present. Um, I was at a conference a few weeks ago in Reno, and it was a wonderful conference called Art and Environment, and um, one speaker spoke about how the British were in the middle of Australia, and they set off um, nuclear bombs and, and, and testing, and somebody else talked about it in the Southwest, and then we were talking about, you know, people extracting things and pit mining and fracking, and, you know, we were all kind of understandably outraged, because, you know, it was this kind of travesty, but then... Mylin came and she was talking about, of course, climate change and the huge, huge mass extinctions we're facing. And so I just think we have this sense of like, we're right, and those people in the 50s or whatever, or John Muir, they were wrong. And, uh, you know, it's just a different intersection of space and time. So I just have, you know, it's so, it's so easy for me to be kind of smug here today. Like we've got some answer and, you know, now we know we have one on John Muir or something. I, you know, it just seems like it's just a continuum and we're, you know, we're lucky to be here, but we're facing some of the worst stuff ever. And I, I flew down here this morning. My carbon footprint is pretty big today. So I don't know. Well, I walked, so that, that oh. was. <laughs> um, and I, I guess the only point I'd like to make is that, um, you know, as I said when I was talking, you know, I, I, I believe in these wild, wonderful, amazing open spaces whether they're in the middle of Australia, where I've done a lot of work, or, or here in California. Um, but, but it's also the case that humans have a giant impact. They had an impact during Muir's time. They have a bigger impact now, simply because there's more of us. And one of the things that I think we can really take 
from being here. One of the things I moved to LA three years ago, and one of the things I love about being here is that I don't think there's anywhere else in the United States and maybe nowhere else in the world where that, that transition from amazing wild space, blazing open, not pristine, but awfully damn close, open space in the Santa Monica Mountains, for example, or the San Gabriels, coming into the second biggest city in, in, in the United States over a transition of a few miles, it's so stark and so amazing, and it gives us so many opportunities to use LA as, as a place where we can understand how wild space and humans can work together in a very effective way. Um, that was part of Muir's legacy and what he wanted to see in California writ large, and I think LA is the perfect place to explore that. Um, so I think about John Muir standing in front of massive sequoias, and I kind of do the opposite. I look at tiny, tiny insects, and I you can't go and look at a massive sequoia in the heart of Los Angeles, but I can go and look at a, a tiny, tiny insect that's here, that's been here longer than us humans have been here, and I can revel in that, and it can give me some hope, and it can help me a little bit with the green guilt and the eco-fatigue that we like feel on a regular daily basis, and a lot of the people who come to the museum especially to like the first Friday's kind of audience, they're like, they're not gonna listen unless we're giving them some hope and something that they can do. And I think citizen science is, is one way to do that because they, they're feeling like they're trying to contribute at least to trying to make a bit, of, a bit of a difference in the city. Okay, so we have time for two very, very quick questions. <laughs> uh, emphasis on the quick, and I need the microphone to come down to, we'll go there. As, Yeah, my question is, is uh, for Peter. Uh, I wonder if you're in your position uh, able to pursue <laughs> alternatives uh, to placing the solar, massive uh, solar plants at sensitive areas in the desert. Uh, one of the alternatives, obviously, is what's known as distributed solar energy. In other words, convincing people to get solar panels on their roof, which don't involve the desert and they don't involve the construction of transmission lines. The secondly is, I found it interesting, you mentioned Cadiz Valley, mm -hmm. and of course there's a company called Cadiz Inc., which you may or may not be aware of, that owns a vast amount of land yep. out there for various water-related purposes. Mm -hmm. Have you by any chance approached them about uh, using some of their land for this purpose, or is that kind of beyond the scope of your, uh, your endeavors? Um, well, in the second point, I mean, that's way beyond the scope of my <laughs> endeavors. <laughs> um, and, and I mean, I should say those are data that um, we are just now analyzing and we are, I mean, really just have been coming in in the last few weeks. And so we're just kind of getting a sense of what's going on. Um, and, but I think it would be a, an interesting thing to try to, to uh, pursue. Now, in terms of the distributed energy issue, and again, I'm, you know, I'm a reptile and amphibian biologist. I am not an energy biologist, an energy uh, engineer. But um, certainly the distributed model, that is you know, putting solar panel farms um, on top of warehouses instead of on top of pristine desert, is one that as an environmentalist appeals to me very much. Whether it's feasible, how well it works, how well it works on a large scale, and you do have to think large scale for a large city. Um, those are things I don't know, but I think we are exploring, I think, as a community. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Very quickly. Yeah. The next next person. Right. Very quickly. Do give her the microphone. My question was very similar, and I think you've answered it. And that was, are the solar power companies willing to work with you and listen to your scientific evidence about where they might build their whatever they are, and um, protect the tortoises. And again, very briefly, um, you know, I haven't, as I say, we're just getting into this business uh, from a science point of view. Um, to a certain extent, everybody has to work together on this. I mean, it's federal law that says you can't mess with the tortoises too much, or at least you have to mitigate a lot. And so um, that, that sort of forces partnerships. Um, and we're seeing those kinds of partnerships all over the place. The Nature Conservancy is a big proponent of that. Um, lots of other uh, environmental groups are partnering with business. And so, yes, they will. Yes, they have to. And, and it'll work to some extent. Conflicting 
Okay, so thank you um, very much to our panelists. Uh, thank you to the audience. Uh, we're going to, uh, in order to get Semi back on time, we're going to give you a 10-minute break.